Thank you very much for the introduction. Um, like uh, the uh, gracious man said, I am uh, Justin Mayer. Um, I, um, I won't be taking uh, questions after the talk, but I love to connect with people. I would love to, to talk to you about uh, some of these topics. So by all means, please come up to me afterward. Um, I'd be really excited to, uh, to talk to you. Um, I'll also post the, the slides on my site uh, after the talk. Um, you can see some links to Twitter and Mastodon for, for those new kids on Mastodon, and I'll, I'll post uh, the links to the slides there when I'm done. So I'm originally from Los Angeles, California. Uh, last year I moved to uh, a small village in the Italian Alps. I work on software related to uh, privacy and security, and I also write about it at uh, justinmayor.com. In my spare time, I maintain a few open source projects, uh, including uh, Pelican, which is a static site generator. Um, and today I'm excited to talk to you about the, the Zen of Python dependency management um, with a little sprinkle of, uh, of package release automation uh, tacked on. So why is dependency management important? It's important because we share code with one another. We incorporate open source software that other people wrote into our applications and libraries in order to speed up development time and to improve the quality of the things that we ship. Um, it doesn't make sense you know, for a lot of us to write our own crypto libraries, so we go out and we find someone who knows tons more about that stuff than we do, and we grab the bits and pieces that are useful and we integrate them. The average package on uh, PyPI relies on someone determined uh, two or three dependent packages, which is not a big deal in and of itself, but that can have cascading effects where those depend on two or three other dependent packages. And as you take this to its logical conclusion, you can see how you kind of have this rather significant dependency tree. And this is important also because of the notion of reproducible builds. And reproducible builds are important because say you're a company and you have new employees, or you're an open source project and you have new users. You want them to be able to bootstrap your project as easily as possible, and they can't really do that if they're getting dependency conflicts and so this is a way of, among other things, making it so that they can easily um, get your software up and running. And you also have other environments. It's not just development. There's uh, testing, staging, production. You want to make sure that the thing you're working on in one of those environments is going to behave in as similar a way as possible in the other environments. So reproducible builds are important for that reason. Now, a related topic is packaging. And uh, packaging is, uh, is also important because uh, I want to use code that someone else wrote for reasons that I just described. Um, and I want that to be done as easily as possible, and packaging is what helps make that more uh, facilitated and easy. And at the same time, I also want to share code with other people so that they might benefit from, from the stuff that I wrote and to make it as easily, as easily as possible for them to use it. So, it, consequently, there's a lot of talks uh, about uh, packaging, and there's, there's been a number of them uh, here at this uh, conference alone, which I, which I think is really interesting, and they all kind of overlap in interesting, uh, interesting ways. So the packaging ecosystem uh, in 2018 looks a little bit like this, and I say 2018 because we'll talk about some of the newer ones, but so there's like some tools over there on the left, and there's some files over there on the right, um, and this is kind of what things look like today. And it's, if anyone who knows anything about these tools and files can tell that over the years, uh, packaging has kind of morphed and accumulated like new uh, you know, appendages. And as it's kind of you know, uh, moved along, it's, it's shed other things. Um, but it, you know, at some point, it, it, it kind of starts to look like this conglomeration of, of uh, you know, accreted bits over time. Um, and, and I think that there's a tendency to, to look at it in a somewhat negative uh, way. Um, and I think the cool thing is that some people are saying like, no, actually, maybe we can look at this a little differently and, and look at it as we can celebrate uh, all of these little bits. Um, does everyone know what a platypus is? Um, I don't know the German or, or French words for platypus, so if, if you don't know, ask someone who does know. A platypus is a creature, has a duck bill, it lays eggs, it's a mammal, it's a really strange animal. So someone came up with this idea, I, I wish I could give credit, but I can't recall where I saw it, 
But um, they, they said, we're going to celebrate the strange and continuing evolution of Python's packaging systems. So I think a, a, pl a platypus is a, a great metaphor uh, for, for Python uh, packaging. It's, uh, and there, some of the things they mentioned are, uh, as, as far as the metaphor, it's a bit odd to start with, uh, but then you realize it's the result of evolution in very unique circumstances. And it's actually quite cute and friendly most of the time. And it can in incapacitate a human with its venom, just like packaging. So it's really difficult to fully grasp the, the finer points of how these pieces fit together or how they have evolved to their present state. So I'm not going to try, and I'm instead going to focus on the tooling that exists today and some of their practical applications. Um, for some of the finer points, uh, Dustin Ingram, who works on PyPI, gave a great talk last year on uh, PyPI and, and, and packaging and its history. Uh, Hinnick has given great uh, talks. He gave one yesterday on, on how to manage a, a project when it's not your job. Uh, Mark Smith gave a great talk on, on um, packaging in general and how to get something on PyPI. Um, I want to talk a little bit about some of the new stuff. So there's PEP 5.17 and 5.18. 5.18 defines a new configuration file called the pyproject.toml file. And this has the potential eventually to replace uh, setup.py, requirements files, setup.config, manifest.in, and probably other configuration files I'm, I'm leaving out. It doesn't, it, um, this PEP is long, like most PEPs, but it actually specifies very little. It specifies a file name, uh, the file format, which is TOML, uh, a build system table, and a tool table. It's a little bit like the Wild West with this right now, where every build system is allowed to put stuff in it and can uh, kind of do the build however it wants. There's no real standard in terms of how they do that. Um, some folks feel like the side effect of this could be a kind of vendor lock-in where you, you use one particular tool um, and, and because there is no standard, then you're kind of locked into it and it'll be tough to migrate. Um, I, I suppose that depends on how hard it is to convert how one tool defines their dependencies, say, in this file, and then to migrate that. I, we'll, we'll find out. Still, still early, early stages. So the, the build system can be defined in this way. This is how you would define it in a, in a setup tools context. Uh, for poetry, yeah, you define it um, like this, and this basically just tells uh, you know, the system that we're using poetry to, um, to manage and build this project. Uh, you can add different configuration uh, on a uh, tool namespaced level. Um, this is how poetry keeps track of uh, your dependencies. And you can only use a tool, um, you can only use a name in the tool namespace if you are the owner of that named package uh, in, in PyPI. Um, so let's talk a little bit about, uh, so that's the pyproject.toml file, um, which will be relevant um, when we talk about some of these uh, newer dependency management tools. And when I talk about them, um, I'm going to mention the, the dates of last release, when they were released last. Because that relates back to the first slide, you know, which is why is packaging and dependency management important? And that's to distribute and share software. And, and software that's sitting in a version control system and not inside a shipped release is software that for the most part, for average users, may as well not exist. And so to me, steady releases are an indicator of project health and thus uh, are important. First, I'm gonna talk about PIP tools. Um, so pip introduce requirements files, which allows you to pin your dependencies. You can have hashes of those dependencies, so you know that the thing you are putting in your requirements file, when it installs, it will actually be that file and not something else. Um, and this Im improved reproducible builds and security. The problem is that pin requirements get outdated, and they need updating from time to time, and that's a bit of a hassle. And pip tools has some uh, ways to make that easier. The pip compile command lets you compile a requirements.txt uh, file from your dependencies, uh, and those can be specified either in setup.py or in a requirements.in file. Then you can use pip sync to take the, the compiled requirements file and then update your virtual environment with the dependencies you've declared inside uh, those, um, those requirements. And that makes sure that your um, different environments, wherever they are, are fully up to date and reflect the requirements that you've specified. 
So that's a very focused tool, and, and it uh, does something you know, very discreet. Um, in contrast, pipenv uh, does a lot of things. Um, it manage, manages virtual environments, so you don't have to. Um, it audits packages for security vulnerabilities. It um, does dependency resolution to make sure that one package might depend on a different version than another package uh, needs. So like pip tools, it, um, it keeps your dependencies updated uh, and your virtual environment current. Uh, it does this in the context of a pip file instead of a requirements file uh, or the newer pyproject.toml file. When I last used it, and I'm going to express opinions fairly freely, um, it was relatively slow. Um, I don't know the, the dependency resolution um, I'm referring to. I don't know if the dependency resolution has um, improved since then, but it was a bit slow. Um, and you know, lots of software is opinionated, but I feel like pipenv is, is quite, quite opinionated um, on, on the spectrum of opinionated software. Um, it replaces the requirements.txt file, but not setup.py or setup.config or manifest or any of the other parts of the setup tools ecosystem. So you still kind of have to manage all of that uh, stuff. And you still have to put your high-level dependencies in setup.py and your pinned dependencies in your pip file. It, um, just in terms of how the project is managed, it vendors a lot of packages. Um, it uses its own patched versions of pip, of pip tools, and, and maybe other things. Um, that's not really my style to, to just like you know wholesale sweep a bunch of software into my repo, but I'm sure they're doing it uh, because they have so many different things they're trying to accomplish, and it's the same way for them to manage it. So I can understand the benefits there. Their virtual environment management, if you just want some other tool to manage your virtual environments, you don't want to know where they are, you don't want to know what they're named, you just want something else to do it, it's great for that. For me, I prefer to manage them myself, and so it, I felt like I was kind of struggling with it. Um, and so one of the things it does is that I believe it hashes the path to your project, takes that hash, and then appends it to your virtual environment name. And when you sort of depend on a predictable virtual environment name for other tooling, this can be kind of problematic. Um, just a silly example is I use the fish shell and I have tooling that shows me the virtual environment that's activated and I don't want to see this like big ugly hash like you know in my prompt line every time and so I had a really hard time getting around that and that's obviously minor but we have opinions. Um, so you know this, this notion of unpredictable virtual environment names like apparently I wasn't the only one who had a problem with this there's lots of open issues about it Maintainers kind of were like, eh, we're not going to address this anytime soon, and they just keep closing them. Um, but, you know, again, uh, so by default, another uh, thing to know is that when you, when you run pip, pipenv add to add a new package, uh, it updates your locked packages. Um, now, you can disable that, but for me, I found it to be a strange default. I just want to add this package to my project, and then all of a sudden it's starting to update all of the, my locked packages. Um, and so for me, it kind of violates the principle of least surprise. Um, but um, I, again, you can disable it, and I'm sure they had good reasons for making that the default. The uninstall command will remove packages, but not its dependencies. So you have to use pipenv clean to remove the dependencies. So it seems to me like it's an extra step. Maybe there's good reasons to separate those steps, um, but it just wasn't what I expected. It can also manage .env files if you use environment variables and you want them loaded into your, um, your environment. Um, uh, that's, that's cool if you need that. For me, I manage that at the shell level, so it was kind of like an extra feature that I didn't need. Um, the initial paces for releases of pipenv was really insane. Like it, just, like it, it seemed like everything was just shifting out from under your feet um, in the beginning. And then it's kind of slowed, like projects as they mature tend to do. But the last release was like eight months ago, and at some point you start to wonder, you know, again, they probably have good reasons. It's an important project, you know, for people, and they don't want to break things, but it's a long time for there to not have uh, um, improvements. It's opinionated, which is fine, but it's opinionated for me in ways that don't fit my mental model or, or workflow. Um, I feel like they took on a lot. They kind of overpromise. They, for me, they under-deliver a little bit. And it's, it seems like a wee bit off a bit more than we can chew and are, are kind of um, under the weight of all of that. Um, again, that's my assessment. Try it for yourself. Make your own, reach your own conclusions. 
Um, so poetry is a similar tool. It keeps your dependencies and virtual environments up to date, fast, and for me, more reliable uh, dependency resolution. It manages virtual environments, but only if you want it to. Uh, for me, it didn't get in the way. It uses the new pyproject.toml uh, format. Um, unlike uh, the other tools I mentioned, it does not um, rely on setup tools. It uh, can also, unlike um, the other tools, can build and publish uh, packages to PyPI. So if you are managing this particular project, you're also using it to, uh, if you're also publishing it to PyPI, you don't need an extra tool at this point to do that. I feel like the project is managed very well. It's, um, some PRs get rejected because the author is trying to keep the core manageable, and I, and I really respect that. Um, one thing that some folks might run into, you cannot install into a specific uh, virtual environment. You can't say like pip install dot dot virtual env foo. Um, you can only install into an activated one uh, or into the default home wherever you want that home to be. Another thing to note is that you'll need, uh, users will need uh, pip uh, 19 or higher to install packages that are built without setup tools. I also noticed that poetry generates a setup.py file. Um, so it's, uh, but there's not much documentation as to why. I assume it's for backwards compatibility, but um, I'm curious to know a little bit more about what, what that's about. Only pure Python wheels are supported. So if you're trying to build anything with C code, um, this is not the tool for that just yet. It doesn't, uh, when you build, it doesn't, it increments your version string in the pyproject.toml file, but if you have version strings in other files, you'll have to manually track those down and replace them. Um, there's only main and development environments, so there's nothing like, you can't say I want, you know, a specific dependency section for testing or for releasing uh, new things. There's some really good features in it uh, uh, marked for the 1.0 release including a plugin system, which would help give a home to the you know, rejected pull requests uh, you know, and still keep the core as lean as possible. I feel like that's a sensible way of, of managing things. There's a per project configuration coming, um, which could be used uh, something like this to specify a uh, virtual environment on a per project basis, giving you a bit more control over uh, where your virtual environment is. Um, and also, um, incrementing version strings is also on the, on the roadmap as a, as a nice helper when, when building things. So in summary, I feel like it's managed well, it's updated regularly, um, it fits my mental model and workflow. This is a newer project um, with a so, sort of interesting choice of name. It's like, you know, dependency hell, wee! Uh, it's, it's like a celebration of the thing it's curing. Um, so they're um, trying to support a lot of things in it, uh, setup.py, requirements.txt, pip file, poetry, they really seem to be like, we're gonna support every piece of this ecosystem. They're, they audit uh, packages for security vulnerabilities. Um, it has like a pipx like ability to um, isolate command line tools in isolated virtual environments. It's trying to do a lot. Um, it, it claims to be like better than all other tools, end quote, which to me always gives me pause, but it's a new project and I haven't uh, given it a full run through, so something to have on your radar perhaps. So at this point, I wanna talk about a related topic, which is release management. Once you've managed your dependencies, there is another step towards uh, Zen-like enlightenment um, because Getting something that, that you're, uh, getting your project onto PyPI uh, has, there's simply too many steps. And none of them are fun. And they're, all of them are tedious. You generally go through your, your, your uh, get commit history and you start uh, putting bullet points into your change log. You um, start manually updating version strings, sometimes in more than one place. You then commit and, and push those changes testing, building your package, publishing your package. Um, there's just a lot of steps. And, and usually, another thing that's, that people run into is only a subset of folks with uh, commit bits usually have the ability to publish new packages on, uh, on PyPI. Sometimes it's only one or two people. So this is a part of an um, open source project readme that documents how maintainers can release new versions of this particular project. This screenshot shows five steps. There are 14 in total. 
the funny part is this project's purpose is to automate GitHub releases. So like I thought that was really interesting irony. But this is totally normal. Um, the, the list for some of the projects that, that I maintain is even longer. So at some point, like did anyone see the Chernobyl TV series? Like, this is how I feel like it. So you have your clipboard and your list of steps and you're just hoping that you don't miss a step, you don't push the wrong button, you don't end up um, you know, breaking the package for you know, potentially a lot of users. And so it's a little bit stressful. Um, and, and a side res uh, result of that, whether it's uh, conscious or not, is that we don't do it as often as maybe we want to or, or should. Um, as a personal anecdote, I once noticed that a year and a half had gone by um, since the last time I had issued a, a published release on, on PyPI, and I was horrified to realize how much time had gone by. Um, you know, because I, at this point, I feel like I'm, I'm failing at my job as, uh, as a maintainer. It's, it's a volunteer unpaid job, um, but it's, it's still something where I feel responsibility to people and, and I don't want to let them down. So it's not good for maintainers because it's stressful. Well, it's also not good for users because you have this slow release cadence. And bug fixes and new features are sitting in the master branch. Hardly anyone is benefiting from them because they aren't in a ship re shipped release yet. You know, PyPI account owners on vacation and some critical bug fix gets merged by another maintainer. Well, it doesn't matter. You can't get it into a shipped release. So you now have this critical bug um, that people are running into. So there are sort of bes bespoke uh, custom ways of automating this. Um, um, and, and so you can use continuous integration to, um, to sort of take continuous integration one step further. So after it runs your tests, it can then say, okay, well, let's figure out a way to, to publish this and you can automate it and have that um, uh, so that it's not as manual and error prone a process. Um, so I wanna explore one way of how that might work. One way of doing that is by auto-publishing releases um, upon a PR merge. So in this context, the pull request has to include a release file with two bits inside. One is the release type, major, minor, or patch. The other is a change log entry, a description of the changes in that pull request. So the maintainer looks at the pull request and says, okay, uh, tests are included, docs are included, code looks good, the release file is there, merges it. At that point, the uh, continuous integration system can look for the release file and put, uh, grab the um, major, minor version, the designation, uh, increment the version. It can then uh, take the description, uh, prepend it to the change log, and then run the equivalent of git add, git commit, git tag, git push, all of that, and publish the release to PyPI. So there's some real benefits to doing this. With almost no human input, every code contribution results in a new release in a matter of minutes. Every feature and bug fix gets its own release without anyone having to remember to uh, package and publish a new version. If a bug is found, it's now much easier to trace it to a specific release version. And of course, you don't have to use this, uh, if you had the system in place, you could also issue new, uh, um, issue releases manually at, at any point. But my favorite part about this notion is that, the, is that all contributors get to issue their own releases. Like what better way is there to welcome new contributors than to reward them with a dedicated release that's composed entirely of their work? I'm not saying it's right for all projects. Um, for some it may not be a good fit. If you maintain a library that uh, is depended on by critical uh, you know, network infrastructure or services, maybe this isn't a good fit for you. Uh, maybe you can figure out ways of, ways of making it work. Um, some maintainers may think, well, I, you know, I don't want to see this release history clutter where every tiny little fix here and there you know, re results in this long list of, of releases. And it's true, um, you know, even something as minor as a, as a typo fix gets its own release in this, in this model. And, but I would encourage people who, who have this uh, reaction to it to, to really think about it. Like, would that be so bad? Would, you know, is that a serious problem? Is a, is a tidier, uh, you know, history really worth sacrificing all the other benefits? So around this time, I was trying to solve uh, this conundrum 
I, um, I came across an article that describes a, a, this type of solution. And Hypothesis is a property-based testing library. They did a really nice write-up of, of how they arrived to this and how they solved it. And around, um, and then sometime afterward, I, um, I noticed that, uh, that uh, Patrick Arminia, who has a uh, Python uh, GraphQL library, was uh, looking to do the same thing. And he asked his friend Marco um, if he could figure out a way of adding that same thing for, for Strawberry. And so he did that. He connected it up with CircleCI. And I really liked the, the simple, elegant uh, approach that he took. And um, rather than uh, taking the, you know, the bits and customizing them and then copying and paste those across multiple repositories that I manage, I thought it would be great if I could just use one tool and, and kind of just kind of pip install it into these different projects. And so, and then that way other maintainers could, could have benefit from this as well. So I called Marco and I said, you know, hey, I generalize this a bit, you know, is this something you wanna uh, work on? And he said, sure, if I have time, I, I would be totally up for that. And so I took his code, I added some more, I put it into its own GitHub and, and Py PI package and uh, just, just pushed it last night as a matter of fact. Um, and so to see how it uh, could potentially work, this is um, a bit of configuration for CircleCI. And it's not obviously the whole thing. It's just, this is just the deploy step. And so you can kind of see, I, I know that the type is really, it's on a white or black background and it's super small, so you may not be able to see it in the back. But essentially, it runs through some of the normal steps that you would take uh, using um, uh, CI steps, um, you know, modifying permissions, installing packages that you need, but it also then uses uh, this, this new tool to do things that you would normally have to write your own scripts for. Checking for the release file, um, preparing um, the, the code for this new release, um, uh, creating the, the commit, getting the commit into GitHub, um, getting the GitHub release created. So um, it's still very, very early stage. Um, feel free to check it out. All of the good bits in it are Marco's. All of the terrible broken bits are mine. Um, there's lots of room for, uh, for improvement um, and uh, would be very interested in, in any input um, or, or contributions to make it more flexible. It has you know, very limited utility in terms of scope at the moment. It's meant for using circle CI, it's meant for people using poetry. That could easily be, or, or at least somewhat easily broadened uh, to, be, to, to do a little bit more. Um, so, um, I, I'm interested to see what people can do with some of these new um, uh, improvements to the overall dependency management and, uh, and packaging ecosystem. Uh, because the overall goal is to make it easier to, uh, to use helpful, helpful software that other people have, have uh, written and to share the stuff that, that we do um, and to do that as frequently as, as possible. So with that goal in mind, I hope that you found this overview of uh, dependency and, and release management to be enlightening. If you have any questions about this at all or just want to chat, um, please come up and say hello. I would love to talk to you. Thanks very much for coming.